Welcome to the lecture. This is the review lecture for the Declaration of Independence reading assignment you did. Um, hopefully it didn't make you fall asleep um, like I fell asleep while on a boat ride through the jungles of Costa Rica. Um, I woke up only when a fly flew into my mouth. It was horrible, but someone snapped a photo of me sleeping. So let's get to the lecture. And don't forget, the Declaration of Independence is awesome because they know how to rock out. N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T -E 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 Do you know what that mean, man? I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T Do you know what that means? So, the most famous words of the Declaration of Independence right there on the screen. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So you did your reading, and before I begin, like, the quick overview, I want to let you know that if you're ever interested, you can check out the Declaration of Independence, because it is, one of the copies is in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., inside this building, and it's pretty cool. You go in there, and you go through tons of security, and they have tons of protections, temperature, and security guards, and it goes down underground at certain times to protect this historic document. So in DC, go check out the National Archives. Now the most basic question, the one that you probably all know, is the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence is Thomas Jefferson. So, bring him out. Introducing Thomas Jefferson. His reputation is expanding faster than the universe. He once had an awkward moment just to see how it feels. He lives vicariously through himself. He is, he is the, most the most interesting, interesting man in the world. Thomas Jefferson is the writer, the author of the Declaration of Independence. It is his words that we read um, in this historic document. And of course, he's also on the $2 bill and your nickel. A couple things about Jefferson. Early 30s, writes this Declaration of Independence from Virginia. Pretty wealthy guy. And at the same time he's writing these historic words, all men are created equal. Here is a guy who owns slaves, who fathered a slave child. So it's an interesting contrast or hypocritical stance. Jefferson personally hated slavery. In fact, wrote a section denouncing it, which was later taken out when the southern colonies were like, heck no, you are not keeping that in, this Declaration of Independence. We will not fight a war for independence if you're going to try to end slavery. So that section was removed. So you got Jefferson. If you're ever in D.C. looking at the Declaration of Independence, there's all these monuments to him. You could see this is the giant Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. You could see the famous words of the Declaration of Independence carved into the wall. In fact, there it is from a distance. This thing's huge, and it's quite beautiful at nighttime. You could see the tourist, and you could see the giant Thomas Jefferson hanging out inside there. Now, it was written in Philadelphia. Independence Hall, if you're ever in Boston, you can go check it out. This, this is the building in which the debates and the arguing and the creation of this historic document was, was formed. Um, so Independence Hall, Philadelphia, but more importantly, why was it written? And there's a bunch of different reasons. One, hey, 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 goodbye, England. The most obvious reason is it's our breakup letter with the British. It is the 13 colonies united saying to England, we are free. We are declaring our independence. Pretty nifty title, the Declaration of Independence. Now, if that was all it did, it'd be a document, it'd be important, but there was more to it. Something else, they outlined a new government. They didn't create a new government but outline this idea that we have freedom. Would you be willing to trade all the day from this day to that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! freedom! 
in the Declaration of Independence, they also outline this idea of natural rights, that the people, the United States, the people that are creating this new country, they have them. Natural rights, also sometimes referred to as inalienable rights. So that's part of what this document is doing. And finally, they're saying... They're justifying their independence from England to the rest of the world. At the end of the Declaration of Independence, and it's in your book, you can read it, there's a list of grievances against the king. These are all the reasons why we're doing it. So for the rest of the world, France, for example, hey, help us out. We're declaring our independence. This is why we're justified. This is why you should be down with us. So this stuff is in this document and the big deal, and it's hard to kind of appreciate, here we are way off into our future with our Twitters and our Instagrams and all our modern conveniences and politicians are always lying to us. And these 56 people though, you know, there's a lot of flaws here. We'll get to that in class. But these guys are sacrificing their life. By doing what they did, they have committed treason against King George III. You die for that. Their money. They were predominantly wealthy individuals. Jefferson was as well, and their honor when they sign this document. So you got this document, it's doing all these different things, and Jefferson's the primary author. Now if you have any questions, pause, rewind, rewatch, still questions, email me or ask in class. Now here's the thing a lot of people also don't realize. Is this guy, I know what you're thinking, that ain't a guy, that guy right there, was the inspiration for some of the ideas in the Declaration of Independence. And he was a guy who came up with this idea of the social contract theory. He is none other than John Locke. And he was an English philosopher who wrote about the meaning of government and the theories behind government. And he was writing in the 1680s, way before Jefferson, and he was a product of the Enlightenment. The age of reason, this idea where the, it's not just government, but science and all sorts of different parts of the world where you're looking at the world in more complex ways. You know, before the Enlightenment, most things were explained, God, 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 or the king, 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 king. And John Locke and other people like him were the product of this idea that you use reason, science, and logic to explain the world, including why we have government. And his ideas influence Thomas Jefferson. And here's what he said. One, the power of government comes from people, everyday people. That governments exist because people give government the power. And with that power, the government is given it to do things for the common good, to protect our rights are inalienable rights. And this is all back to this place that the people have the power and the government is there to protect our rights and promote the common good and ultimately people can change the government if the will of the people is no longer represented. This is the social contract theory. Government power comes from the people. We give it power to promote the common good, the community, and to protect our rights. And if the government does not reflect the will of the people, the people can change that government. That's what Locke was talking about in his essays and books about government during the Enlightenment. Jefferson reads these ideas, he's influenced by these ideas, there's all the crazy drama with the British going on, with taxes and regulations and things like this, the colonists no longer want to be a part of the English Empire, so Jefferson writes this document. So, quick review, why do we have government? To create it, government is created to secure and to protect our God-given inalienable natural rights. We all are born with these things. They're inalienable. You cannot alienate them. You cannot take them away. You cannot steal them. Everybody has them. 
They're natural. The other part of this is government is based on consent. So people give the government the power. The power of government comes from the people to protect their natural, inalienable, God-given rights. This is the purpose of government. Hit pause if you need to write it down or rewind if you're lost. Now here's the key terms, and we're almost done here. These are things that you need to keep in mind. I am a real American, fight for the rights of every man. I am a real American, fight for what's right, fight for your life. Little hawk. Hulk Hogan theme song right there. So inalienable rights, rights that can't be taken away, God-given, they can't be taken or given away, natural rights, rights that every person are born with, kind of you can use those terms interchangeably, inalienable and natural rights, pursuit of happiness. John Locke actually wrote pursuit of property. Jefferson changed it to pursuit of happiness. If there's a quiz on this, I may ask you that question. Pursuit of happiness, basically, it is the right of people in a constitutional democracy to pursue their happiness in their own way, as long as they do not infringe upon the rights of others. So you can seek out your opportunities, your happiness, but you can't take away from other rights, other people's rights. So, you know, this is, this is tricky. Liberty, freedom. So these are these ideas that are being floated around in the Declaration of Independence. And I want to give you a quick little preview of this document. It's in the book. I highly recommend you read it. There may be sections of it on your test. But here it is in its glory. The unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. And most famously, you got John Hancock with his big, bold signature. The, the legend of him writing it all large onto the document showing his support for this movement for freedom or independence. And you get all the other people following his lead. And uh, back in the days they used to say, place your Hancock here when they wanted your signature. Now the most famous part and the part that I expect you all to know is this section. This is the beginning. When in the course of human events, when in history, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. So the colonies, one people, are going to get rid of their allegiance to another, England. And to assume among the powers of the earth, we're going to be a country like all the other nations, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. So there are these rights that God and nature endow on all people in all countries and we're going to take those equally as a new country a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impel them to the separation meaning we're gonna tell you why we are breaking up with England we're gonna tell you why we are going to declare independence and this documents going to do it this is the Declaration of Independence. This is an historic document. Um, we have a holiday, the 4th of July, even though it wasn't exactly the 4th of July in which the Declaration was unveiled. But we have this document. It celebrates many of America's ideals. It articulates a vision for a country. But I want you to think about something here. Here it is in 1776 at a time when women were completely denied the right to vote. And it wasn't just in the United States, but in the United States, it would be all the way until... The 19th Amendment. It wouldn't be until the 19th Amendment in 1920 that women would be granted the right to vote. The picture you see right there is Abigail Adams, wife of John Adams, who was one of the American founding fathers, second president of the United States. Abigail, through the American Revolution, asked her husband not to forget the ladies. And it would be 
all the way until 1920 before the basic right to vote would land uh, or be given or be granted or finally earned by American women. If you take a look at African American men, it would not be until... The 15th Amendment, in 1870, there's a picture of Frederick Douglass, the 15th Amendment would finally grant African American men the right to vote. So when we think about the American Revolution, we have to keep in mind that there was a tremendous work to be done. In fact, for African Americans, men and women, it would not be until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 before voting, especially in the South, would be protected by the government. 1965. In fact, while the American Revolution was being fought, here are all these different major battles. There were 400,000 people in slavery throughout the 13 colonies who were not granted equality or liberty or opportunity. Nonetheless, the document, the words of Jefferson and the inspiration of John Locke and others created a document that would be revered around the world. Hopefully, you didn't fall asleep. The end.